Can I come and look at it? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's a pretty good guy. And the hemp is messed up there. Oh, is it? Is that getting off the ground pretty bad? I think so. All right. Now we are live. Uh, let us call the Beltrami County work meeting to order. Uh, and we will start out with uh, the community health board update. Megan. And again, would you just introduce yourself for uh, the millions of people watching from home, oh, okay. but no pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yep. So I am Megan Hoyer. I am the public health director at Beltrami County. Uh, thank you so much for having us here today. We really uh, just want to bring an update in front of the board today. We're not asking for any policy changes, no new uh, mandates. Just wanna give you a picture of where we are currently and where we've been the last couple of weeks as we've seen a few changes with some of our COVID numbers uh, in public health. So, oh. huh, okay. so um, this is already outdated itself from when I filled it out this morning. We currently have 113 active cases, not the 90 that we had this morning. This is a pretty big increase from where we've been the last two months or so. You'll see a little bit further down in the slides, but um, eight hospitalized cases, not all of them are from Beltrami County, five of them are. Age ranges from 54 to 89, and all of those hospitalized patients are unvaccinated at this time. Um, if you follow any of the MDH data, you will have seen two new deaths pop onto our Beltrami County dashboard within the last couple of weeks. Those are deaths that have happened a little bit further back, but are just now catching up on that data. Uh, both of those deaths were 70 years and older. I don't have the vaccination status that becomes unavailable to me after they pass away. So this looks similar to what we're seeing across the state, what we're seeing across other states in the, um, in the United States, but I thought it was important just to bring to you guys to get a picture of what we look like currently. So this chart is something that for the past year, we have been sending to the schools. Last year, they helped use this data to make some of their stay in school decisions. So this, um, and I apologize for the huge print for you, but I wanted you guys to be able to see the actual numbers. This tallies months as a whole. And then if that, that gray section that's highlighted, that's just the past 10 days, which was one of the metrics that the schools have used in the past to calculate what they call a case rate. So that's why we have those highlighted, but just numbers alone, not to inflate or make them look, um, untrue is just a tally across the bottom. You can kind of see where our busiest months have been, where we've dipped off a little bit. June and July, we saw um, very minimal cases and now have started to see this increase in August. A lot of this increase is because of the Delta variant. Not all of our tests that are done here locally are sent on for sequencing tests. That's the test that breaks down the virus and really looks at uh, every part of it that can pick out the different variants. Uh, but across the state, we know that this accounts for 75 to 80% of all positive cases right now. All right, so one of the bigger questions that we get more commonly now is what ages are we looking at? So this is another breakdown that we've given to the schools to really help depict if school aged children are being affected or if it's the parent age range or uh, the older population. So this just breaks down right now, our age ranges are from two months to 89 years. We have a couple that are two months, four months, uh, one year right now, and then pretty much most of the age ranges, they, they scatter. We are seeing some younger people be, uh, become positive. A lot of that is because they're not eligible for the vaccine right now. So the host for the vaccine is getting smaller and smaller because some of our older populations are, we have a higher percentage of vaccination rates. So that's why we're seeing some of these younger groups become a higher level of positivity. 
All right, so levels of transmission. This is newer on the market from CDC. It's one way that they're looking at the circulating virus within the community. So it's not a total encompassing picture, right? Because it doesn't look at vaccination rates. It doesn't look at risk of the population. It doesn't look at availability of testing, but it does look at positivity rates and how many cases we've seen in the last seven days. It's broken down into four levels of transmission and some of the guidance coming from the CDC and MDH is directly related to what air or what level of transmission your community is at. So the red is the high level. We are at the highest level right now and have been for uh, the better part of a week now. Before that, we were sitting at, at substantial for several days. That substantial and high comes with some additional recommendations around masking and spacing out gatherings and such. Just recommendations, not mandates. So a lot of our area right now is in that high level of transmission. Sanford right now is sitting at a positivity rate of just over 10%. If you look at the state data, it has Beltrami County at about 6.4%, but that's taking tests from all of the areas that are testing Walgreens, CVS, um, our IHS partners. All right, so our best defense right now is a strong offense and our vaccination rates are um, stable. They haven't changed much in the last month or so. So this, is, this has got a lot of data on it and let me tell you what you're looking at. So those two bottom uh, trackers are state data. That tells us where the state is. If you look at the very bottom line, that is individuals that have started one dose. They have received at least one dose of vaccine broken into three different age groups. The line right above it, so where you see completed vaccine series, 16 and up is 54%, 65 and up 86%, 18 and up 66%. What I have on the side there in that little graph is, or in that table is Beltrami County's numbers. And those were numbers as of yesterday uh, but it breaks down, and this is just for a single dose of vaccine. This isn't fully vaccinated individuals, but our 12 and up group is 55%, 16 and up, 57, 65 and up, 88. And then our total population is 46%. And like I said, we've been hovering right around that mark for, uh, for a while. Sanford has seen a slight increase in people interested in vaccines. We have not, but we're ready in case we do. There is some new guidance just recently. It feels like it's coming out just as fast as when the virus first um, came around, around boosters. Right now there's been approval for, for booster doses for our immunocompromised individuals. So for example, uh, people fighting cancer or having recovered from cancer, organ transplants, some other immunocompromised diseases that might require high doses of steroids. Um, so that is a goal right now. There is just as of the last 24 hours, a push from, um, to have boosters for all of the general population. That, it, my understanding, won't come until the FDA issues full approval of the vaccine, uh, but that that will be recommended at eight months and then potentially again annually. But that is, that is hot, hot off the press. So we will see as that goes. And then the last thing I really, well, two more things, but breakthrough cases, a lot of media attention around breakthrough cases right now and what that means for vaccine efficacy. And I think it's really important to just have it out there that we ex expect breakthrough cases to happen. We know that vaccines aren't 100% effective uh, but the, the vaccines are still doing what we want them to do. They're still preventing that severe disease. They're still preventing hospitalizations and significantly decreasing the risk for death. So um, the thought behind breakthrough cases is the more time the virus has a chance to mutate and change, the less effective our vaccine could potentially be. So the sooner we can get our vaccination rates up, it decreases that window of the host that the virus has to attack and then potentially have the chance to mutate. 
Um, currently, 97% of our hospitalizations uh, in the United States are because of unvaccinated individuals. So I think that's something to remember. And, and right now our hospitalizations follow that. Um, many breakthrough cases, a lot of what we don't know is what happens behind the scenes. So many of these individuals also struggle with other disease processes that affect their body and inherently make them at a greater risk for infection. And then also in, in a lot of these breakthrough cases, we're seeing milder symptoms and shorter symptoms. So um, vaccines still remain the best way to get ahead of the virus and give it a chance to not mutate. Uh, our goal is to keep people at work, get kids in school, keep kids in school um, internally to maintain a strong workforce. We want to see people be able to come to work. We want to see kids be able to go to school. One thing that has resulted out of our most recent increase in cases is we did have another isolation need that we uh, facilitated through one of our partner agencies at Village of Hope. Um, and as a result of that, we have secured some funding through MDH that has been matched by some of our ARP funds right around $62,000 to help support that need if it were to arise in the near future. So that is what I have for you guys today. What questions might you have for me? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. I'm still baffled by the lack of information on masks. Um, I, I've done uh, contractor mask classes where they talk about the size of particles and and all of that sort of thing and i fully understand that it's for gross uh coughing sneezing that sort of thing but but i think more numbers more information needs to be put out to the general public about why the cdc and mdh and everybody says that masks are so so important when it, it it's, it's very well known that it doesn't block a virus. You know, that, that virus is such a small particle going through that mask webbing that's this big. It's not blocking any virus stuff, but it's just blocking that gross kind of stuff, the, the heavy spit and, the, and, the, uh, and, and all of that sort of thing. So I, it's, it, has, it has really baffled me that there's not more scientific information out there about the masks when there's so much promotion about masks and mask safety, it, it just, I'm a numbers guy and I, I watch numbers. I look at scientific data and why there isn't more scientific study on masks. And with that, the second part of that whole thing is the wide variety of masks that are out there. I mean, anything from a neck gaiter to a, uh, the little cloth, disposable mass to the cloth mass that they made in black duck to, you know, there's such a wide level of mass efficacy too, of, of how efficient they are. And so I it just, as an elected official to make a, an, an intelligent decision, I would just really like to see if there's more information from the CDC, Minnesota Department of Health, uh, any of those health organizations that would help us make those tough decisions Right now, we haven't had to as a county board because it's uh, it's been pretty much handled by at the state level or the federal level hasn't really stepped in yet. But th that one has baffled me. It's it's a it's a question has always been a question in my mind because a little knowledge they always say is dangerous, right? And I have a little knowledge on masks, uh, you know, for protecting construction workers and protecting against airborne particles of concrete, uh, sheetrock dust all of that sort of thing. Uh, and then they get into the same discussion about pollen and, and germs and the size of those particles. So I, I would just appreciate from a, a very respectful point of view, more information on why so many of the health organizations feel that masks are so critical when uh, to me, that's, that's a hard one for me, just it is. And I, and I, I think I'm speaking for, for quite a few other people. Yeah. I mean, there, there's two schools of thought on this that mask, very important, mask, not important. So I, I would like some more information on that. If you can, if you can get any of that, CC it to me, email it to me, 
put it in my mailbox, whatever you could do, Megan, I would appreciate it. Sounds good. I, and I do appreciate you bringing that up because it's one of the pieces of information that's a constant controversy out there. Mm -hmm. And to your point, what is your mask made of? Does it have giant holes in it? Is I it saw a decoration? Mask right. At a grocery store. And that's so not, that's not super helpful, right? <laughs> yeah. And I haven't been able to get my hands on all of the studies that are out there, but I can get you some, uh, Commissioner Lukacek. I do know in a recent um, JAMA Medical Journal article that they were looking at both the exhaled particles that were stopped and the inhaled. And that study showed 50 to 70% of what you exhaled was stopped by the mask. Now, depending upon what your mask is made of, that factors into that. But I'd be happy to get you some information on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But you can say pretty unequivocally, can't you, that masks do help reduce uh, uh, the spread of COVID? Yeah, unequivocally. I, I think if we look at our flu numbers last year, they yeah. were I mean, pretty non-existent. Now, part of that, I think, was because we weren't testing for flu as much as we were testing for COVID. So I think we need to acknowledge some of those pieces as well. Uh, but to, to not have a single transmissible case in school, I think that goes to show that the masks do have that ability to protect well, both. Can you make your statement again, please? I said that unequivocally masks help reduce the spread of COVID. That is, I mean, that is, I, I don't think that that's I debatable. I disagree with that statement. Well, I, you can disagree with yeah. a lot of things. I, you know, I do too. <laughs> yeah, I, oh, I know that you guys do. I know you do. But that doesn't make it, but, that doesn't reduce the veracity of my statement. But Mr. Chair, didn't you hear what I just said? The lack of evidence to prove what you just said, the lack of science to prove what you just said, it's not unequivocally that the mask is the savior in this thing. So, and that's the discussion at the school board level. That's a discussion in the community level. That's a huge discussion. So to make a statement that you said, Make sure you back that statement up with what is that based on? What science is that based on? What statistics is that based on? And that's what I was asking respectfully. Can I get hard numbers and real science behind a mask is really the savior to our health dilemma? It is a tool. I didn't say that it is a savior. I said that it unequivocally reduces the spread. It doesn't mean that it's not gonna that it's gonna save you in every situation, but you know that by wearing a mask, you're reducing your chances of catching anything or or spreading it. No, I don't. I don't believe. Well, that. again, you don't have to. <laughs> I'm not trying to convince you, but there are people, there are organizations that are trying to do whatever they can to sow doubt into these into these um, uh, recommendations, and so yeah, so all I hear is that is that masks don't work. But well, where are you going for your information? You know, doctor. Um, it, you know, when it's, when it's your turn to talk, I won't interrupt you. So um, um, I, I think that there are people that are purposefully trying to sow disinformation to make it seem like the science isn't clear. I think that the science is very clear. I think that we have known that for a long time. You know, it was, there's tons of anecdotal information like, like what Megan just said about the, the lack of, of flu transmission last, over the last year. You know, a lot of that had to do with the fact that everybody was masking up. We know that there are other cultures that whenever anyone has a flu or a cough, they'll wear a mask and it reduces the spread. It isn't, it isn't a silver bullet, but it is definitely a very effective tool. And I, 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 don't, I don't know. And, and again, Mr. Chair, I just ask respectfully for additional information to try to help me understand that. And, I, and Megan said she can get me some yeah. studies and provide that information. So I appreciate that. Thank you. And just from our perspective, it's one layer. We know that it's like that Swiss cheese model. It's not just one thing that's going to slow the spread. It's several layers of protection that we're looking at. It's hand washing. It's staying home when you're sick. It's staying six feet away. It's wearing a mask. It's several layers. Any other questions for Megan? Appreciate the update, Megan. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Megan. And do we have more to the to the health board update or was was that well jim we need to argue for another 20 minutes <laughs> <laughs> no and you know we, that that is respectful i mean mm. I, I, it is it, it's two different perspectives so to speak and what commissioner gospel said 
is that, you know, I, I'm not basing this on just how I feel. I, I do talk to doctors and, and medical people that, you know, have said what I, Megan, what, what she closed with was very important. If you're sick, stay home. You know, that's how we've gotten by a lot of big flu epidemics. I mean, when you have flu symptoms, don't go to work. Mm -hmm. You're not that important. You need to stay home. You need to stay away from people. And we found that that's a huge, that's a huge stopper to keep people away from other people when you have symptoms of mm -hmm. yep. H1N1 and flu. And, and now with this new virus, if you have symptoms, you need to stay away. What, what I am, what I fear is that, you know, you've got, you've got a hundred doctors, 99 are saying one thing, but then you have people that are going for that one doctor on the fringe that is saying, no, this is all junk. Oh, no, I don't you know, know. No, there are thousands, you know, it's not 99 out of a hundred. So, Mr. but again, I asked for, I asked for that information right. to get some, get some scientific information, get to be able to make an intelligent uh, analysis as an elected official so that it's not, you know, it's not about us sitting up here how we feel personally. You've got to do your homework and you've got to get some more of that information. And, uh, and I've been trying to reach out and talk to medical people and, and, and our health folks and say, give me the numbers. Help me, help me solve this problem. And that's what we got to do is we got to solve it all together. Hi, Becky Secor, Director of Health and Human Services. I just had a couple of other quick kind of broader things. Um, one thing to note is we've had several staff test positive for COVID. And when we've had that happen, um, it brings up a number of issues for us as far as personnel and how we deal with quarantine, isolation, work from home, all of those things that go, and masks, all of those things that kind of go along with that. I think across the county, there's been several of our departments that have had to deal with this. So one of the things we've been doing is trying to update that um, return to work plan and COVID plan that Kay put together quite some time ago. So we're trying to put a little bit more to that so we can help make some informed decisions and help put some guidelines to how that works for folks. So that's one of the things we're doing. And I know there was some conversation from different folks about we're making people wear masks. We haven't made anybody wear masks. When we have a unit where somebody tests positive, when we do the contact tracing, we do let folks know if they've been within the area that the person that tests positive and do recommend masks and recommend more social distancing, recommend more monitoring of symptoms so that people can make informed decisions. At this point, I, I think, um, we are comfortable with that process, but we wanna put a little bit more. So probably at the next board meeting, we'll be bringing that plan forward, at least I hope so. Um, so we can get that moving. It, with that level that's, that's coming forward for us, I think that we have to do our due diligence to get that set up for our staff and to make those recommendations. I just wanted to let you know that we have had those cases in house and we're doing our best to respond case by case right now, but hope to get that plan forward. Thank you. Mr. Chair, yeah. um, uh, Becky, um, when you have those situations, how, how is there a, any rough percentage of your staff that would be able to work from home, you know, so that they could still actually be productive or is, you know, is that a very small number of your people? I think that it's kind of more than just our folks, it's across the county and our folks yeah. in health and human services probably have in general, more opportunity to do that than a lot of folks do. Um, we put we implemented that last year right. and had pretty good success. So what we're doing with the plan is trying to put some guidelines along when and how that will happen and what the responsibilities are um, and who can do it. I mean, we are putting some parameters uh, around not just anybody. If you're if you're working at the jail, odds are you can't work from right. home. But if you're doing our income maintenance work, it's pretty easy for us to get a computer to you and have you work from home. So that's would, what the plan yeah. will do is kind of put those parameters around that a little bit. I think that would be common sense and logic, especially since we were already prepared for it with the technology and everything else that we'd try to let those people work from home if that's feasible for them to do that. There's some hard decisions with it though, because we do have such a range of feelings and thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. um, and we get everything from, we, we want the whole building to know if someone tests positive to 
this is nothing. So we have, we are trying to find that middle ground mm -hmm. where we can make good, safe decisions. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that only burned six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll figure out a way to fill up this thing down there. a very important discussion. Yeah. yeah. And, and we are very polarized on it. And there's, yep. you know, there's folks that feel very strongly that way and very strongly the other way. And there's a lot of folks that are more middle grounded trying to find that that good, right solution. You know, if, if, if someone can bring more data forward to show folks that the masks are doing so much better, but statistically, when you look at probabilities and statistics and, and numbers of things that, uh, of states that didn't have masks and that did have mass mandates, the, the numbers are all over the place. So there, there is no definitive science behind if this population all wears a mask that it won't have as much incidence of the virus. Hi, Chris. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. Good afternoon. Chris Muller, the uh, Emergency Management Director of Beltrami County. Um, if you'd have told me a year and a half ago when I got pulled in to start helping with the, the COVID response that I'd be doing it a year and a half later, I'd call you crazy, but here we are. Um, so one of the things that uh, I've uh, helped uh, the incident command team with this public messaging and getting information out in a timely manner. Uh, as you all know, we utilized the um, Beltrami County Emergency Management Facebook page, as well as working with our GIS department, we um, developed a COVID-19 resource hub. Over the summer, um, we really migrated to using the hub versus the social media platforms because um, by their inherent nature, social media ground um, is really an opportunity for people that want to push one side or another are able to debate openly. And it takes away um, what our intent was in our public messaging. So not only did we cut back on the graphics and some of the other stuff that we were sharing, is we went to more um, pointed information so people can um, go to sites and do some of the research for their own. So what I'm hearing, um, particularly from um, Commissioner Lukacek, is when uh, information is gathered and it comes to some kind of a consensus, is this what the County Health Board um, would like to see put out to the public? Or is this stuff that you want um, reported to you to make a decision as to what goes out? Or I guess from an incident command team is what would you like to see for public messaging coming from us? I'd like to see it before it gets put out as personally, but. Um, yeah, I guess so, Chair, yeah. I, I, I have a, a great faith in, in, in Chris Muller and, and, and uh, Health and Human Services that I don't feel like I need to micromanage, you know, the information that, that they put out. You know, I, I think they've uh, done a stellar job, you know, uh, so far in, in, um, in our COVID response. You know, I, I believe that there's, there's uh, some of us that, that you know, with, with no matter amount of uh, information we have, you know, we're still gonna have our, our beliefs and, and there's nothing that's gonna change our mind. I, I, I believe Sanford Health, um, you know, their doctors and, and their team are, you know, doing a great job as well. And I don't think they would be lying about the information that they would put out. And if we don't believe what they are saying or telling us, then who are we going to believe? You know, it's, you know, it, I mean, I, I think we have a responsibility as a, as a community health board to put politics aside and really look out for, for our community. Thank you, Tim. Commissioner Sumner, if I may, um, just to point out that we continuously are working with Sanford every week. We're talking about what's going on, not only in community, but also what um, some of their projections are, are showing as well. So um, we don't have anything major that we've been pushing out. There's no call to action. There's no, you know, we want you to really do this. We're just putting out the facts. And uh, if you see no harm in that, we'll continue to put the facts out there. Um, and we're going to continue to shy away from our social media platform and utilize the Beltrami County Hub because that um, prevents a lot of the debate and a lot of the um, opportunity to try to persuade people one way or the other. And that way we're using trusted sites, um, only <laughs> journal of medicines and other 
um, information that is deemed credible is what we we cite and reference and, and put out there. So um, we'll continue to, to roll that out. And uh, if we ever um, arrive at the point where we have to have a call to action, obviously um, we will coordinate with the county health board when we when we do that. So. I mean, you know, look at some of the activity that we've had over the summer. It's really easy to tell people there's a big fire in Eccles Township and they don't second guess you because they can see the smoke. But COVID is so invisible. It's hard to um, accurately you know, paint that picture and, and let people know what to do. So we'll just continue to do what we've been doing for the summer. Um, but just wanted to, and I know that there's a lot of public out there that are asking for this information. Well, that, that takes a lot of labor for us to make those graphics and put that information out there. Uh, time we simply don't have. Um, so we'll just continue to put the uh, information out on the hub and we'll be able to make it so. Thank you. Anything else from the board? Should we move on? Mm -hmm. All right, then we'll move on to uh, identifying future work meeting topics. Does anyone have anything on their mind? I just have a question. Uh, Tom, I uh, ha have the planning commission coming up here next Monday, and I did not get any information on it regarding the VRBO short-time vacation rental stuff. I'm wondering if you've had conversation with Brent about that. I would have expected it to be on our Monday night uh, discussion. Uh, thank you for your question, Commissioner Gaspic. I did talk with Brent uh, personally about that. He's assured me that it will be a conversation that will be before the planning commission uh, at their next meeting, which is okay. be next week. So. He's I got my packet, there. but it was not in, I didn't see anything in that packet about it. That's why I, mean, I just got the, the information about the four variances. So that's why I was asking. I will double check again, but I know that he and I have had the conversation and he's aware of it and uh, was instructed to put it on the planning commission okay. to have the conversation. Uh, but seeing that you haven't seen it in your packet, I'll invest I don't recall it. seeing a, an agenda. So maybe he just didn't have the agenda done yet. Okay. And he maybe just sent out the, the um, variance requests uh, okay. and, and uh, hasn't got the agenda done yet. So it's possible that he does have plans for it, just didn't have it on an agenda done yet, maybe. Okay. I know he's aware of it. So okay. uh, I have every confidence that he'll include that. But uh, I'll double check just to make sure. Appreciate that. Miss that date. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Okay. Anything else from the commissioners? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, when we were out uh, at our meeting last, was it last week or last couple weeks ago when we were in Deb? Mm -hmm. Two yeah. weeks. Um, you know, there, there was a question about uh, from, from some of the township supervisors uh, in regards to uh, solid waste. I guess I'm kind of curious, you know, uh, what, what they pay for solid waste and and do we as a county pay and, and um, some sort of discussion about that? I mean, it, to me, it doesn't really make sense for, for them to pay, you know, $100, you know, if, if they're using their, 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 their buildings. If they're know. not generating trash. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's, I guess I, I, I didn't want to really forget about that you know, conversation, especially if we go out to, to these communities and, and ask them, you know. The, the, um, the fee system versus tax is kind of a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's almost splitting hairs because I mean, it is, it is generating, you know, it's a government agency or a body generating revenue, but by having a fee, it allows us to assess it to every, every parcel and not just uh, uh, commercial and, and residential. Um, so every church out there, every school, every single non-taxable parcel is being assessed those fees. The, my shelter gets assessed those fees. So if, if we are going to take that away, then we have to figure out another way to make up the, the, um, that revenue. You know, and that's the kind of the, the slippery slope there of, of, of exempting one um, or another uh, classification, I guess. Um, I mean, I think that's the rub is that then we would have to make it up on, on residentials and, uh, and, and businesses. Um, and it's kind of when I was on the city council, we got a lot of, I got a lot of phone calls because people would say, why do I have to pay a stormwater sewer bill? There's no curb and gutter on my street, right? But you're not paying it for the curb and gutter in front of your house. You're paying that, that makes you able to drive downtown when it's raining, you know, that it's, it's taking care of the whole system that everybody benefits from is why we all pay those small fees. So it's, um, it's not always a, a, to the uh, 
to the to the entity that's being taxed or or get uh, being assessed the fee, they're not always really happy with that explanation. But you have to figure out how else are you gonna. It's a, it's a way of spreading the the I guess the pain or whatever around the most amount of of parcels. Mr. Chair, I think a good example of that is the utility industry. Um, everybody's got to pay for the big transformers and the big generator and all of that. So they establish a basic fee of 50 bucks. If you got power coming into your house, mm -hmm. 50 bucks a month. I, if, you know, if you got a, a little hunting cabin, if you got a little lake cabin, if you got a small house, it doesn't matter. Everybody gets 50 bucks. Then you get charged on top of that mm -hmm. for how much usage you take from the system. So that happens in the utility business. Your <clears throat> reference to the storm sewer, you know, mm -hmm. I'm, when I got an, uh, annexed into the city of Bemidji, out of Bemidji Township, they put me on the, the storm sewer system. I, I had nothing. I, I didn't have any curb and gutter, mm -hmm. but your analogy is correct. You're paying for the overall big system, mm -hmm. and it's a base fee. I, I pay $38 every quarter for my solid waste. I haul my own garbage, mm -hmm. but that's that basic. Mm -hmm. That's what helps pay for that transfer station and for the system that we have for all of our solid waste. So it, the, the fee structure versus a true tax structure. And that's another thing we could like, uh, quoting you, Reed, we could sit here and educate the public on so many things that all of us have learned as county commissioners on how the Northwest Minnesota Juvenile Training Center works, mm -hmm. how the road system works, how the solid waste works. You know, we've, we've been doing it for umpteen hours in every committee meeting and the more information we get to the general public to tell them how all that works the more clarity there is on how what we're doing and how we divvy that money up makes a difference mm -hmm. and it matters mm -hmm. and, and we need to we need to make sure we do our homework on that stuff and we ask the hard questions so the solid waste thing is just the, the most recent that has taken that next step to where we have to establish that baseline and then figure out how to charge above that baseline for whatever, as Commissioner Sumner said, if you're not using your building, why should you have to pay that? Mm -hmm. I think you have to pay that baseline to keep the big picture in tune. The other piece of that, Mr. Chair, is uh, the, uh, as a process of this, we also uncovered that those same entities that had gotten missed, we're not paying the E911 fee. And, and so regardless of if they did get abated on the solid waste, they would still have the E911. And there again, it's an access fee. It's having, so we have a system for emergency 911 and for solid waste, it's for the system, is not necessarily about how much you use the- But I've, I, never, I've never called 911. Exactly, right? yeah. So you know, just, just because you haven't used, it doesn't mean that you don't want to have it available. Right, yeah. So. yeah. Good question, though. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's, again that too is yeah it's one of the rabbit holes you can get down to because then it gets into the philosophy of 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 how how a government entity raises its revenue. Um, well, and another thing too with that we do try to put in topics like this in the newspaper that we mm -hmm. circulate every quarter, mm -hmm. and if people would read those articles because there's another one coming out from Solid Waste at the next one that will have information that it's pertinent. And if people read that, then it's easier for them to understand. And Brian will also be on chat about several times coming up in the next several months uh, right. to help um, as a different media to to get out to the public. Good, Mr. Chair, per item number three, identify future work meeting topics. Uh, you and I have been privy to what's going on. Should we do a work session discussion regarding the ARP? Uh, currently and what's in the in the 2022 and into 2023 should that be a work session i think it should i mean we're gonna have to yeah. at some point because that's I mean, not a simple discussion right and it's not it's i don't know that that's something that that we can just put in the um you know the consent agenda at some time or or just have as a as a i even hesitate to even have it in as just a, a topic um whenever we talk about it, it's going to take some time. So whether it's in a, if it ends up being in a work session or, and then, and then a vote in the, in the uh, regular meeting. I think you could easily put it in the work session mm -hmm. for half an hour discussion. I think Phil, Commissioner Sumner, Anderson and Gosvig in on what you and I have learned yeah. on that ARP, the case statements that are requested, how much is there, how mm -hmm. much we can use, how much we want to use, 
how much mm -hmm. we're trying to push into 2022, 23, and when and beyond when it's done. Yeah. I yeah. would appreciate that. I, it's it's going to take some time. Yeah. It's it's complicated. There's a lot of requests. It's it's a lot, it's a lot of money. Lot of um, and yeah, I think it's a good topic, but it. Uh, rather than push it ahead of when it get, all the research gets done, I, I agree with you. I think we should really have a good debate or discussion on it. And, but and it's very integral yep. with our budget. With, process, yeah, yeah, right. Because the case statements are, our case statements levy related are being reduced because mm -hmm. a lot of those items are being requested through the ARP funding. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our budget, budgeting process has been very different this year. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know, Reed, if we even have two case studies, case statements that are in the requested in the levy itself. Everything's I, gotten moved into our. Yeah, I think originally there were like four and we got it down to one. Yeah, we got three of them moved out of yeah. there into the ARP fund. Or into some other, yeah. For impact from the virus. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, when are the uh, budget meetings done? Is that tomorrow? Uh, or tomorrow. The, yeah. No, wait. What no. do you, yeah, tomorrow morning okay. is, is our last. We'll three up. So yeah. it would be, so, so that you would be pretty, well, okay. for two weeks from now, you would two weeks from now when we have our next meeting or whatever, three weeks from now, whatever right. it is. But you, yeah, I think we'll want to do it. I mean, we'll want to do it. And, and Tom, uh, you were looking like you had something to say there too, but we're going to want to have that discussion before we set the, the, the levy, because like yeah. you said, because once we set the levy, we can't, we can only, once we set the provisional levy, we can only reduce it. And if some of these case statements that we're looking at at IRP, if that doesn't work and we want to put them into the budget, that's going to push up the levy. And we need to make sure we do that before we approve the provisional levy. So could we put it on the next work session then? I think so. I, I would be in favor of that. It depends on, <laughs> it depends on how much time Tom and, and folks need to put that together. Yeah. When I don't is want it, to rush it either. If we don't get all the facts uh, and we start to discuss it, we're not, we're going to be rudderless. Kind of the cart before the horse. Yeah. Approaching. I'll, I'll let you finish your question. Yeah. No, when, no. You're, you're going to ask the right question. Yeah. When do we uh, when do we approve the provisional budget? I forget or the preliminary budget. Yes. Yeah, so that's coming up. Yeah. It is coming up. Is so, it the last week of September? I'll let you talk. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, <laughs> you all are asking the perfect questions. And this was in my administrator's report, so I'll just give you okay. a little detail here. So, uh, no, uh, absolutely, we had talked about having the budget committee be the one that was going to initially review the ARP requests and go through those, letting staff and that committee kind of vet them out, make sure that they met the criteria and also were the highest priority for the county. Um, that work concludes tomorrow with the budget committee's meeting. Um, from there, yes, we do need to have conversation about ARP as a separate piece of the budget, but they are related. So initially we had intended for that conversation to be included with your debate about the, bud the full budget, because what you decide to do with the ARP funding may or may not have an impact on the, on the county's overall budget. So, um, so that's going to be important. Our work will be complete and we'll be able to make a recommendation by the next board meeting. So we can have this presentation that you're requesting um, by the next board meeting. I'm confident of that. Um, you'll still have time, however, to kind of debate that and come back to the following meeting, which is the meeting that we have to set the budget by. Okay. So uh, September- The last meeting in, yes. in September. Yeah. So September 7th, the proposed budget will be placed uh, in your hands. And then we'll come back on September 21st and you'll need to approve the proposed budget and certify the proposed property tax levy. If you don't, then you still have a little bit of time because the statutory deadline is September 30th. So you could call a special meeting if you if the debate goes long, for example, and and come back together before September 30th. But the levy does have to be set. The preliminary budget does have to be um, approved before uh, or on September 30th. So I think we can meet those deadlines, no problem going Good. forward. Super. And yep. Mr. Chair, if I may, the last thing you said, <clears throat> that's why I would advocate for a work session to help out commissioners Anderson, Sumner, and Gospig mm -hmm. and get them more information mm -hmm. because I'll be honest with you, if I wasn't in the, the discussions that we had in there and it's brought to the table here about ARP funding, I would probably not have viewed it like we were reviewing it in our budget system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be different. Yeah. So we have a spreadsheet put together. 
Uh, Jody's got that spreadsheet pulled together really well with what's what and how that all pulls together. And to share that with, with all of you is very important on how we get this budget established and to set that, that levy on September on our, on our deadline yes. and not call a special meeting. Yeah. Which, I, which I, I'm confident you all can do. Yeah. Um, we have pre-vetted a number of these uh, requests and taken them off. For example, we had over, we have almost $14 million worth of requests just this first year. Uh, and we've taken um, a number of those out, um, probably close to 8 million of those off. So we're sitting pretty well. What we're doing right now, Jody and I and Sam have gone, are going through the criteria more closely on the ones that were kind of questionable. And some of them are actually going to get moved in as eligible that we didn't think were eligible based on our research. So uh, we'll be talking about all of that tomorrow with the budget committee, but we'll, we'll present a package to you uh, and uh, you'll, you'll have an opportunity to kind of debate and talk through all of that. I, I think it'll probably be maybe a little longer than 30 minutes uh, because there's a lot in there. Um, and there's some philosophical and you know policy conversation that you'll also want to include. So um, we'll carve out the appropriate time and, and put on the next agenda. Great. And then um, I have one item that I would like to see in, in a future work meeting, and that is just an update on um, on uh, uh, the chronic wasting disease and the fence up north and how that's going along. And, and I would love to hear from the DNR as to whether or not they um, have any, where their suspicions are about whether or not we've been able to mitigate a potential disaster or not. I have seen some deer with masks on. With masks on. <laughs> <laughs> do, oh my do prions, do they, oh. do they fit through the masks? <laughs> we um, where would we have a better answer to that, Mr. Chair, once uh, November rolls around. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Lots, absolutely. Of, lots of deer get tested, we'll know. Yeah, yeah. Oh boy, I'm... I'm right now it'll be a guess, I think. Yeah. But at least I'd like to, to just know how the, if the, fen the fence is up, it's doing its job. I think we should have hired a bunch of 14 year olds with dogs to just run around that area <laughs> all, all summer and, and keep the deer out. Um, okay, then let's us move on. We did it. We're two minutes behind. So yeah. <laughs> see, Magic I'm, go I'm good at what I do. Magic how that works. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the, to the uh, Red Lake uh, Watershed um, District uh, Annual Report. And um, I'm, I don't have it in front of me. Not sure who is. Hello. Hi there. Would you please uh, state your name for all the, the people watching from home? You bet. I'm, I'm Brian White. Uh, I'm the county's appointed seat on the Red Lake Watershed District. Each county has one. Some counties have two particular seats, but we have a board of seven managers. And I'm in my fourth and a half year of service with the watershed district, they're three-year terms. And so I'll be coming back most likely to talk to you and hope for reappointment a year and a half. And bottom line, what I bring to the board, I used to spend a lot of time in this meeting because my office is above, up above when I would work for the Board of Water and Soil Resources. And when I worked for the Board of Water and Soil Resources, I primarily worked with watershed districts, Myron as well, uh, on watershed planning and that sort of thing. So. I look at my position on the board to bring that expertise to move forward when we're trying to decide what type of watershed projects we should do and how we should move forward to accomplish those tasks. So I always look at our seven member board that each individual board member brings something to the, to the board in terms of expertise and hopefully that's what they think I bring to the board because when you look at the watershed district, Beltrami County doesn't have a majority of the land within that watershed. And, you know, we're looking at forested areas and, and that sort of thing. Not a lot of agriculture, a little bit on the east side of the lakes. So that's, that's what I try and contribute to the board because a lot of the other big projects are taking place in other areas of the watershed. Myron introduce himself and we move forward. I did have an hour and a half PowerPoint, but in the same time, <laughs> Darn. we won't do it today. But we do appreciate that. <laughs> so I'm Myron Jesney, I've been watershed district manager. I've been in the watershed district world for 38 years. Uh, I know I don't look that old, but I am. 
<laughs> and then with the red lake watershed district system project. So um, the watershed district, this our watershed district is the largest in the state. So there's 43 or 44 watershed districts, almost 6,000 square miles. Um, we do cover a whole geographic area, every heavy A, the beach ridge, forested. Part of the watershed is the right upper and lower red lakes, which is the um, Some of the projects we've done in the past in Beltrami County is uh, we partnered with Heinz Township um, to do the Black Jack Lake Alpha Structure and Watershed District. The Heinz Township didn't have the land to do the structure sale. Um, fish couldn't get back from the Black Jack Lake or we, for that matter. Um, so it was a really they couldn't spawn upstream. Or so the watershed district applied for a grant for partnership with the Heinz Township and their constituents to take care of that structure. Um, so that was completed a few years back. Um, but that's the types of things we will do um, at the request of the local landowners and local units of government. Um, we worked uh, with the um, Beltrami SWCD on projects in the past, um, the James Coleman, uh, Coleman River. Um, doing some water quality projects because you did you look at the geographic area, what do you do? Well, obviously, the upper regions of the watershed are really to protect the resource. All of it up, all of this water that we deal with has to go to the upper and lower red lakes. So, anything out of the reservation boundaries has to be treated before they reach the lake. And keep that resource as healthy as we can. So, um, we have one watershed, one plant that we're dealing with, you guys are all aware of that. Um, we have the upper and lower Red Lake, um, one watershed, one plant that will be hopefully starting next year. Um, we, we've had to, we have to do a four watershed, one watershed, one plant in our watershed district. We've finished two of them. We're incorporating the Clearwater River, one watershed, one plant now, and next year we'll be nothing more. And we may anticipate that to be a lot of protection as well to protect the water resource that we are. On that one watershed, one plant front, uh, was it last year we finally got the Thief River plant approved? And so that obviously had some impacts of benefits provided to Beltrami County. And we were just meeting with Zach at the SWCD. They were going to have, uh, I don't know if it was an open house style or whatever meeting this year, but because of the drought and everything, they postponed it a year. And the intent of that meeting was to identify practices addressing water quality concerns within the Thief River uh, that landowners would like to implement because in this plan and exercises the state does provide a pretty good chunk of change to go in and address the identified problems in the in the plan. I think Thief River is the tune of about six hundred thousand biannually. So it's it's a pretty good chunk of change to address this. Can you add to this not quite. Okay, so we're that's we're just cool. about there. Yeah. That's where I mean, your guys' budget. Um, you know, it's a that is one fund that has really been helpful to do water quality projects, like the Shoreline Restoration and the Bell County Council and mm. flow streams. I mean, so it's really that once you get that funding. Every entity can do the state says 10% match, they require 10%, but it's up to that one watershed one plan all the community to determine what the rate will be for the cost. We're in it right now, 75 million dollars. Um, so but it can be you know, your your own your policy committee can set what you want for the cost you want to require, but 10% is required by the state. So um, you can get a lot of projects done for a really small amount of local. Because it really, it, as long as you know that money's uh, consistent, you can plan out. And they allow you to money in that plan to plan projects in the future using the money that's appropriate, a portion of the money that's appropriate for that. that plan. It's, uh, it's, it's really working well. Unfortunately, we're so lucky to have that form. I, I might add too that the watershed district, in terms of implementation, 
provides the opportunity for each soil and water conservation district to come to the board for the uh, amount of about $12,000 limited scrutiny on, on your request. It's got to be related to water quality. We were just talking to Zach about the water, or soil erosion. So we were just talking to Zach on a couple of projects. So that's another opportunity that the Bell Prime SWCD has been taking advantage of as well as the other SWCDs. So that's that's out there as well. Uh, one other project that has been kind of in real close to Beltrami County that I've been working with, and that's in the city of North Home and the Bartlett Lake. And we started moving forward, working with Commissioner Scoey from uh, Cooch County to try and get a plan for that lake to bring it back so it is a stronger recreational opportunities than exist now because of weed growth and that sort of thing. But uh, COVID set us back for a year. Now with the drought situation, it gets to be really tough because the weeds grow and the water goes away. So that, that's a little bit more challenging. And I might just add one other project that we've been working on as a watershed district that's been going on for a while. And I think we finally came to resolve on how to approach it. That's Pine Lake in Clearwater County. And you may have seen some articles or heard something about that. But we ran into some issues with the DNR allowing us to move forward with some impoundment work to reduce flooding on the lake. After some conversations and back and forth with them for a number of years, actually, uh, they've come to resolve the issue by putting in and redoing the structure for the, the Pine Lake area so we can draw the water down, but yet not low enough where we end up having a fish kill because they want to keep that. So when you get the spring runoff, it has some capacity to bring the water up. And that was that was kind of a controversial project because the landowners were getting real concerned and the state was saying you can't do this. We understood the problem. And so working through that, I think the watershed district brought two, the two sides together and just let bids on that project. So, It'll be a project that really does the best thing. Reduce the rebuild the other structure that was constructed in the 80s, make it more manageable. So we have these 45-mile drainage area, water sheets down off the hills into that lake, small, flashy lake. It'll allow us to you know, move the water downstream, still not causing adverse effects on future as well. But we'll be able to release the pressure off the lake and it's not causing that to prevent that ocean. That's the I think we do with this. We have a lot of projects we did um, over the last two years, over $18 million worth and that's a lot for a watershed district. We did uh, $10 million worth of construction just in 2021. Um, so it, it, we do a lot of projects and they're all listed in this book. Um, and if you guys want one, I have a hard copy. I know we sent the link as well. Um, it's on our website. Um, so feel free to, if you have any questions, you like talking to us, give us a call. Because we really want all the county commissioners and the counties to understand what we do and how we can help if we're asked to. So we really look for landowners and tell what we use the government to get a hold of us and see what the problems are, issues, and uh, just what we work with. And that's why we have seven board members from different areas of the watershed. So we keep coming as we can. Well, do you have any questions? That... Yeah, any questions for Brian or Myron? Um, Mr. Chair, not, I guess not so much of a question, but, you know, um, over the years, I, I've uh, uh, kind of watched, the, you know, the watershed district and, and the work that they do. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, I guess it came by my surprise that um, uh, the Red Lake tribe is not, uh, does not have a seat at the table or, or the board. Um, you know, th they are consulted with, you know, uh, you know, I, I do believe partnerships are, are, are great and, and uh, the partnership between the watershed and, and uh, the tribe, you know, are, are great. Um, and it's my understanding that uh, the way the tribe can get a, a seat on the board is through legislation, correct? So I was wondering, um, if we could, you know, spearhead uh, an effort um, 
to encourage our our, um, our legislators to to maybe include that in some sort of bill for for this upcoming session uh, to include a uh, board seat for the the Red Lake Nation. I mean, I, I you know, I I would think that that they would have you know a board seat or or be a, a partner because you know the lake is is a huge uh, contributor you know to to the watershed. So it's I guess it's my hope and ask that we as a county board uh, take the initiative to to consult with our our legislators on on an opportunity like this. Thank you. And I'm sure the tribe would have to play a role in that in that too for that legislation. Yeah, well, you know, I, I talked to a few people mm -hmm. uh, over the past few years and, and they were, um, you know, they would like that as well. So I mean, super. Any other questions for? All right, well, thank you very much for the report and thank you for the good work that you all do. Thank you for your Thank time. you. Yep. Thank Next you for time his powerpoint would be on either microfish or uh, or the overhead projectors is that what you're saying <laughs> hey, well thank hey, you thank you so much um all right we'll move on to the 2020 financial statement And again, I'll just ask that you uh, identify yourselves uh, when you come up to the mic. Can, can do, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. All right. You know what, this will not be an hour and a half because I looked at the agenda okay. and I got 20 minutes, so I'm gonna have to talk really fast. But uh, if I were to fill an hour and a half, there'd be a lot of stories and like, Probably some karaoke would be involved, <laughs> but uh, so we have the we might have the technology now. Yeah, there we go. Well, I am Doug Host. I am an engagement principal with Clifton Larson Elm, and uh, we have finished your audit. And I'm here today to sort of hit the high points on the results of that audit. And um, uh, <clears throat> after doing the 2019 audit, for the most part. Uh, under the pandemic and stuff. We thought 2020 was just auto would be a breeze and it kind of was compared to 2019, but we just ran into a lot of new things because of uh, this the CRF funding. And I'll touch on a few of those details in a little bit. But um, as in prior years, I'm just gonna walk through uh, the PowerPoint here, which we put together to hit the highlights there, page two. It's just the, the agenda though. These are things that kind of the audit standards tell me I got to communicate to you. And uh, we do that via this PowerPoint. So on page four, um, some of the details of what we're required to communicate to the board um, is done in a letter that I believe is part of the little packet. Yeah, four pages, boilerplate. If there were a lot of bad things that happened in the audit, we're required to put them in there. I'm happy to report there, there weren't any. Um, we didn't have any difficulties in completing the audit. Uh, we didn't have any disagreements with management as we performed the audit. And um, we issued a clean opinion on your financial statements. So what that means is your financial statements as you have there are materially correct as presented. Um, and I do just want to thank all the county staff that uh, get us the 1.2 million documents that we ask for each year to test and, and work through. Okay, it maybe isn't 1.2, I should clarify as an auditor, I don't wanna be accused of exaggerating, but it's a lot. And, and you all know that and, and your staff are just troopers when it comes to uh, getting us the stuff we need and we've really appreciate it. So uh, I just wanna communicate that to the board as well, but uh, we love working with your staff. Uh, mentioned the clean opinion and we also had to do this thing called the single audit because you received and spent more than 750,000 of federal dollars during 2020. 
So page seven, the audit standards require us to do certain testing and reporting. And we look at the county's internal controls and there's just two items that we're required to communicate to you. And one is that we made a handful of audit adjustments of moving some of the revenue classifications around uh, a couple other just uh, items that the actuaries provide. Um, nothing uh, unusual really, that they're, they're quite common, but we're just required to communicate to you that we made a couple adjustments to every the numbers that were in your books. And it was mostly just for financial statement presentation purposes. So um, nothing real uh, alarming, if you wanna call it that. And then segregation of duties, we do department audits on a rotating basis. There's some departments that collect money or disperse money. They don't have a lot of people there. So there is not complete segregation of the accounting functions. We're required to just put, give you the heads up on it. So now we've done that. All right, next page nine. Um, I mentioned the single audit that we performed. We tested, I believe it was four programs uh, this year, the SNAP, which is Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program the CRF program, medical assistance, and the Title IV foster care program. And good news is that based on that testing, there were no items that fall into this material weakness bucket. That's really good. Um, there's some other items, definitely minor in significance, even though the technical term is called significant deficiency, okay? <laughs> it really is less significant than the material weakness. So um, I'll just touch on these. And we've had some of these items we've had to communicate in the past, but for the most part, uh, almost got a clean bill of health on certain of these tests, as tests but we'd find like one. So in SNAP, um, there was just one of the 60 cases where the income that sits in a case file didn't match up perfectly with max, didn't impact the eligibility or anything. It's just off a slight bet. We're required to communicate it to you. Also in SNAP, there's some agreements or documentation when they're entering into contracts or it's called procurement. And um, we didn't, weren't provided with supporting documentation of the thought process or methodology that was used. It's kind of a requirement. We talked to a lot of people, a lot of the things that are required to be talked about as the contracts were let was done, just not documented. So we recommend it get that documented. We've tested this in other programs in the past and those programs were maybe more familiar with it. I, I, I shouldn't say because I can't, I don't know for sure, but it's just got to get a document, pretty simple. Uh, also in SNAP, um, and this, sometimes you will get clients transferred in from other counties and they send the work or, uh, case file information with, right, to the county, but some counties are better than others. And I won't mention which counties these were transferred in from, but it'd just be good to make sure the files are as complete as can be when you get them. Um, in medical assistance, uh, um, again, as auditors, we're always looking for documentation. And there's all kinds of case files for medical assistance. And the department heads do some periodic reviews of these. But again, we didn't see any documentation. We talked to a lot of people. It sure sounds like it's being done. But as auditors, we just need to see it. So we just recommend that review process be documented. The next two are kind of tied together. One is it, when we do our testing, there's the case file and Maxis, the system that sort of generates uh, payments, whatever for MA. And there's assets and income documentation in the case files. It gets entered into Maxis. And in one case, those two were not completely in sync. So uh, that's like one point, it's like a one and a half percent uh, error rate in our sample. We didn't even expand our sample to, to see if it was more prevalent because it's just one. Sometimes we are accused of having, what's it called? Get the term now. We're omniscient. We know everything. We know the one case that, that may not tie out. And, you found the uh, needle in the haystack. Yeah, right? exactly. 
So when it's just one, we aren't gonna, gonna expand our testing. And then with CRF, there was some reporting that needed to be done. It did get done. There was a sort of a moving target on when it was due and not real good com clear communication from the state. And uh, four of the five were late, but all the expenditures in CRF that we tested were allowable under the program. So there aren't any of these things called question costs, which if we did find them, then you may have to pay the federal government back some of that money. So yeah, the reports, a couple of them weren't by the very short turnaround deadline, but uh, all the expenditures that were in there were allowed under the program. We also have to, on page 11, we also have to test for the county's compliance with state statutes. And there's a statute, I forget the number, but uh, as far as publishing the claims in the newspaper, it was in last year's report. And the county makes the information available by other means. So it, it's, I have, if I remember, it might be on the website or something and stuff. So uh, we're just required to communicate that one. And then financially, how the county do, page 13, I know we have talked about your fund balance levels in the past. And even back in 18, it was uh, getting pretty thin. And this chart here is for what we call the big three, the general fund, road and bridge and human services, because they're kind of the three big main operating funds. And uh, if you look at the chart, the county ended 2020 with about four months of reserves to carry you into 2021. Many organizations, including the state auditor's office would say, you know, you should have no less than five months. You're a little bit shy of that, but uh, compared to 2018, you are trending upward and towards that target maybe uh, of no less than five months. So um, financial health, honestly, which is maybe this is a bad pun, but your financial health improved during the pandemic, but um, yeah, your reserves did go up. All right, page 14 looks at all your funds, not just the big three. How'd, you, how'd the county do for revenues? They were up about 7.5 million for the year. Expenditures were up about 8 million. So, you know, pretty close gap there. Um, and, you know, when we do our testing, we have to explain each of the accounts that changed a lot from the prior year and almost every one related to the CRF expenditures. So uh, we expected that, nothing out of the ordinary as far as our testing goes there. On page 15, we look at where the county received the revenues from or what sources. And if you look at the table at the bottom, you can see the biggest jump was in intergovernmental revenues. And if I had some treats or something to toss out for anybody that could tell me, why do you think intergovernmental revenues went up 7.5 million? I'll bet you y'all would know. <laughs> yep, CRF revenues. It, 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 I think it was like 6.2 million. So that accounted for the biggest chunk there. And um, page 16 looks at where the county spent your money. Uh, general government was up about, I can't even read my own, writing about 6 million here. And I think on your financials, that's kind of where the CRF expenditures rolled into. As part of the audit, we also verified that any debt payments that were due in 2020 were paid according to the schedule. We have no issues to report there. On page 17, the general fund, uh, for the fifth year in a row, the revenues did exceed expenditures and the overall fund balance increased about 5.2 million, which was like, whoa. That chart doesn't really look like the gap between the blue and the red bars is 5.2 million, and that's because it isn't. But there were some things called these transfers where you transfer money for, between funds, and there, the general fund ended up getting more transfers in this year than it transferred out. So um, when you roll that all in together, mix it up, you end up with the fund balance going up about 5.3 million, and its reserves. Um, for about eight, eight months. So that's uh, that's pretty, pretty stable and it's above that recommended minimum. So uh, general fund, uh, sitting pretty, pretty stable. Next page, road and bridge. Uh, its revenues were up about 1.9 million. Expenditures were up a little bit less than that. Um, 
the unique piece about this fund is a lot of the revenues comes from the state and the highway user tax. And it's a little bit of roller coaster on how much you'll get each year. But uh, as you can see for the last three years, the gap between how much revenues and expenditures is really pretty close. So um, page 19, the health and human services fund, it's fund balance decreased about 1.3 million. Uh, but part of those trans, well, and I can't say for sure because I can't remember, but I mentioned the concept of these transfers before. Well, in 2020, there was a 2.5 million transferred out of the general fund or out of the health and human services fund. I think it went to the general fund. Does that sound about right? Okay, yes, it was. Yeah. I am getting older, so my memory isn't so good. This is like my 30th year of doing this. <laughs> I'm like, I know I look 30 years old, but no, I've been doing this 30 years. And uh, yeah, I can still, I, I do still remember the first time I was here in 2003, I think. And we were back in the old building, but so my memory's pretty good for certain things. But all in all, human services, they get a lot of funding month to month to month because it deals uh, on a reimbursement basis. So it's fund balance level, still a little low. But um, we now I've had two years in a row where the revenues have exceeded the expenditures. So uh, that, that's trending in a good direction. Forfeited tax on page 20, it's fund balance decreased about 120,000. And as you know, with forfeited tax uh, operations, that can also fluctuate from year to year. And, and the revenues expenditure has been very, very tight uh, as well over the last three years. Solid waste fund, its fund balance was up about 68,000 for the year, ended up with a little bit of a positive fund balance. If I remember right, I think the prior year was maybe a tad bit negative. So that's good that we got uh, that into the positive or into the, yeah, into the positive. So on page 23, <clears throat> um, how's the county doing financially, you know, General fund is definitely healthy. It's your main operating fund. Some of the other funds are a little bit less than that target. You know, sometimes the general fund in theory ends up covering that, but that's why it's good to have sufficient reserves in the general fund. Health and human services still a little low. Um, overall, the county's overall fund balances were up uh, over 2019. Solid waste fund is now uh, positive. GASB, which stands for Governmental Accounting Standards Board, number 84 was implemented for 2020. And uh, I'll try to give a 30 second summary of that. In the old days, you had these things called agency funds, right? This new accounting standard, it's, oh gosh, it's thick. And one of the biggest changes was they changed the name from agency funds to custodial funds. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, but uh, there's some additional financial statements in your report this year compared to last year. There's some new funds that show up in custodial, but basically what it was trying to do is get a lot more consistency across all governments in how the fiduciary type reporting happens. The county handle, it collects money and disperses money for a lot of organizations. Uh, watershed districts, I think are one, uh, there's some collections with the airport and uh, you end up being a collection agent for a lot of state of Minnesota revenues. You receive it and have to pass it on to the state. So this new accounting standard just tried to get more consistency across all governments and how those items are reported. But uh, ultimately none of that's county money. So it's just when you're sort of being the collection and disbursement dispersing agent for other entities. And um, CRF, um, you know, we ended up having to report that one item about the reporting. Um, uh, I've been auditing 30 years and auditing that CRF program was, um, is unlike any other program I've ever had to audit. It's kind of like being blindfolded and spun at the same time and trying to, to hit the target, you know, uh, uh, with a dart from an audit standpoint. So, um, but they got the kinks worked out of it and the ARPA will be easy. 
boy, I am such a positive thinker. <laughs> I, I sure hope so, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, let's hope. Yeah, it, it seems like there's less changes coming out every other day like there was for CRS. So, yep, I'm going to look at the glasses being half full and I'm definitely optimistic that, yeah, a lot of those bumps in the road are now smoothed out. So um, with that, I got time for questions. And you want to have any questions for Doug right away? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Doug, can you remind me and maybe mm -hmm. uh, the folks that, that might be tuning in um, at home, what the CRF is? Uh, oh, what's that? Coronavirus staff? Relief Funding. I apologize. We use the acronyms all the time. And it, yeah. yeah, Coronavirus Relief Funding. SNAP is Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. GASB is Governmental Accounting Standards Board. I had one other one in here too. I can't remember what it was. Uh, ARPA. I can't tell you what that stands American for. I just Rescue know that's the new version of CRS. <laughs> it's, it's the American Rescue Plan. There we go. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but yeah, we, we do sometimes fall into a, the trap <clears throat> acronyms because we're always focused on efficiency. If I got to say that whole thing, <laughs> it, it'll take me long. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I guess I don't have any uh, questions for, for Doug, but uh, yeah, I want to um, uh, commend Jody and her staff and her department for, for helping, you know, guide us through this uh, financial you know, thing that we uh, dealt with a year or two ago and, and kind of, you know, guiding us and, and, you know, the board, you know, with, with your um, tightening up your belts and, and things like that. So, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, we're, we're better off uh, now than we were a few, few years ago financially, you know. Yes. I guess which brings me to a question of, of uh, the, the fund balance for health and human services. I know uh, I may or may not have asked uh, a while back about having a discussion on, you know, how we go about, you know, transferring some funds back to the general fund or, or if we uh, forgive that or, or, or something like that. So, I mean, uh, so this, this uh, you know, Doug's presentation gave me a uh, refresh my memory about having a, a discussion about that so I, if I would have remembered earlier in the agenda I probably would have asked so thank you and, and I think Doug did did mention that we did and I don't know if I don't it was last year uh, we did move two and a half million dollars into the reserve fund so I think as the as the department is able I think that the intent is that they will continue to, to help us shore up our, our reserves in the general fund Yes. Mr. Chair, uh, wondering on the uh, the salt waste fund and, and the balance there, was there an internal transfer to that also to make that whole? There was 450,000 transferred into the solid waste fund, mm -hmm. but there was other things that transferred out of the solid waste fund to the tune of 800,000. So the net in that fund, uh, that actually took in about 400,000 more in revenue. Revenues are different right. than transfer. Right. Revenues are, are you're collecting like money, right? But so took in 400,000 more than you wrote checks out. But after that, so that leaves 400,000. But then sometimes various funds will end up transferring money in or the solid waste fund will transfer it out. So for the year, the solid waste fund was a net transferring out more than it received by about 400,000. That's what I thought. I just didn't want to know the people that were listening at home, whatever, that, you know, we we actually were in the red last year. Right. And this doesn't look like it, but we actually were. Yeah. And 2020, a much better year. Yeah. For that area. So, yep. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Doug? Well, thank you once again for a great presentation. All right. Thank you. Yep. Have a great fall. Thank you. Let's do this again in a year. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> All right, then we'll move to the administrator's update.
Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick, couple of quick updates for you. Um, we had continued, or I had been continuing to try to schedule another uh, remote and joint meeting with Red Lake Nation and have been unsuccessful to date to do that. Uh, I'm not getting responses back. So I'm wondering if you wanted to um, have me continue to try to do that. I've tried for several months now, or alternatively pivot and uh, potentially move uh, toward a different location, for example, maybe Black Duck. Um, alternatively, with the rise in coronavirus cases and stuff, it might also be appropriate to pause on that. Um, but I, I leave that to you in regards to requesting your direction on how you'd like me to move forward. I know we tried to target two remote um, or joint meetings for the year uh, when we did, of course, get the one in, but I'm not sure how You'd like to proceed given uh, the current status of things on that any uh, any thoughts mr chair you know uh um i guess I, I would take some input you know from the board you know i i, I would you know appreciate uh, a remote meeting uh black black duck you know is uh you know would be a great uh site um but I think uh, we're kind of in, in that time of the year where, where uh, you know, we, we may need to, to stick uh, to the boardroom, you know, especially with budget and things like that coming up. Yeah, that was... uh, um, you know, maybe it's something that we can uh, entertain, you know, next year, because um, I mean, next month, you know, we're going to be dealing with the, with the budget, October, uh, November, you know, so, I mean, it's, it, those are the winter months. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I want to want to thank Tom uh, for his efforts on on reaching out to the tribe and and trying to set the, set that up. Um, but those are my those are my thoughts. Um, maybe we can you know uh, go up to Black Duck next year and and uh, um, and and have a meeting there. Right, whether whether it's in in uh, one of the townships or or the city city hall, um, you know I I would prefer the city hall. Uh, they, they do have uh, 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 live stream capabilities and things like that. They they recently remodeled their city hall. So, I mean, um, you know, I attended a meeting there. It was the last month. And, and uh, you know, uh, quite honestly, I, I think they get uh, more in-person attendance than we do at a, at a county board. So um, it would be, uh, it'd be uh, the perfect site for, for a meeting next year. Yeah, one thought that I always have is if if we are going to be having budget talks and we need staff to to be there for those talks, I hate to make staff. I don't mind. I don't mind so much making you travel, Tom, but or 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 our our, our attorney. Uh, but um, if if staff, I mean, if staff lives south of town or 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 east of town, we make them drive all the way up for for a thirty minute discussion, and they have three hours of drive time. Um, so if we are going to be doing some intensive meetings uh, the next, in September, then I would I I would say that maybe we should just stay home, stay here. But but I'm fine. I'm also fine to travel. But that'd be my leaning would be to just stay here. I don't know what other other commissioners have any nope. thoughts. I think the commissioner Sumner's reasoning was was pretty spot on, and that uh, based on everything that's happening, we should probably just keep it in the boardroom for the foreseeable future. Anyway, that's my opinion. We could just send ass bargain up to Black Duck and put them in a glass case. <laughs> and just let them and we can and we can oh. watch from the, the dunk tank is available <laughs> now. Um, we'll provide the plums and the tomatoes. The dunk tank is available. The fair's over. So. Yeah. <laughs> and some softballs and yeah. Oh, I'll have plenty of uh, overripe. The two from the uh, Kadab Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Excellent. I've been at a dunk tank before. <laughs> Thank not you with for rotten that. tomatoes. I do have, I will have plenty of overripe tomatoes in a month that I can contribute to the cause. Keep but talking, you'll be on the, you'll be on that podium. On that. <laughs> it was my suggestion to go to Black Duck to do a remote meeting. When we didn't, when we weren't, weren't able to, the Red Lake band wasn't able to fill, you know, mm -hmm. it just didn't fit in any of their meetings. Right. It didn't mesh with any of ours. So it kept getting pushed on. So I suggested, you know, We've had some really successful meetings in Black Duck. Yep. There's a, a pretty good population base that way, and they truly appreciate 
I, I don't worry about making department heads once in a while jump in a car and drive mm -hmm. for a 20 minute presentation. So okay. um, the trouble is like Commissioner Sumner said, what meeting could we do that wouldn't cause a, a hang up with our budget situation? Mm -hmm. So I think we're I think we're snagged for the fall. We'll just say let's leave it at that and take a look at two remote sites again next year. Yeah. Right. We had good turnout when we were I forget was it Summit Township? Summit Township. Yeah, yeah. really good turnout when we when we went went up there. Um so Excellent. maybe we can do one in the spring. That sounds know. good. Thank you all very much for that. Uh, just continuing on quickly, the uh, jail recruitment and retention task force is still uh, meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, and we've uh, been making good progress and are pulling together the package of recommendations, uh, many of which have already been implemented that we've shared with you. But there's three in particular that we'd like to bring to your attention here as we front, as we round those out, which will be costing uh, some money and will also require some policy direction from you. Uh, so what we're doing currently is pulling those programs together vetting them against, uh, well, first of all, developing cost estimates for them, and then <coughs> vetting them against what we believe will be eligible uh, funding for ARP, uh, the ARP uh, funding. And uh, with that, if we can get that far, we're intending to meet with unions uh, that will be impacted and get their impressions uh, while, while making no guarantees on anything, because of course, this is all contingent upon the board. But we figure we do that work first before we put it in front of you, because um, you know, that's a, that's, that's going to be important to have those kind of things lined up before we get this all in front of you. So, uh, I had hoped to try to get this in front of you at the next meeting, but I, I think we're going to have to push off to the meeting after that. Um, the sheriff and his team have done a very great job on this. Um, but I just don't think we'll have the time to run through all of those steps before the next board meeting. So, um, we'll have that for you here very soon. Uh, the budget process we touched on just a little bit earlier in the conversation tonight, um, but the uh, budget committee wraps up tomorrow, as we mentioned, and uh, revisions are going to be made between now and the September 7th date, uh, where you will get an actual, you know, you'll get the proposed budget essentially with the proposed levy and, and those sorts of things. Um, and then September 21st is what we have scheduled for you all um, continuing to kind of debate and then hopefully approve the budget and the tax, the preliminary um, budget and the proposed property tax levy. Um, so we're on schedule for all of that. I think you'll be pleased with where we're going to end up uh, as a recommendation uh, for the preliminary budget. I have to say that I am absolutely delighted with um, how the management team, department heads have approached the budget given the constraints and considerations uh, they have done an outstanding job putting a budget that uh, very well represents, I believe, uh, the county's needs and the sensitivity around uh, property tax levy, and uh, and then also maximizing the utilization of ARP funding to help offset uh, existing county or anticipated county expenses. That that's all gone very very well. Uh, so I hope that you'll agree when you see the budget um, that this will be probably one of the um, I don't want to say easy because you don't want to use that term, but one of the, the better, um, more efficient processes that you can get through to, to get to a, an end outcome on the budget. So um, that being said, uh, next up, we just want to let you know that we're starting to uh, consider the redistricting aspect of uh, the census. As you know, census information becomes formal in September. Uh, and once that does, there are other deadlines that then get, in, get put into place in regards to redistricting and mapping and all of that. So I'm pulling a team internally to meet a little bit later this week to talk about what those deadlines are, what the criteria are. We, we don't have our official census numbers, so there's not, not a whole lot to do just yet. But uh, once we get those you know, timetables do, do start to tick in and uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're clear on what needs to happen, when it's going to happen, what the impacts might be, and so on and so forth. Um, also, just want to let you know, I sent this out to you in email, but it's really for the public's uh, benefit. There is a campfire ban now that's been put in place as of today by the uh, Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. The commissioner did order a, uh, a restriction on open fires in various portions around the state, uh, and that includes Beltrami County. So signs will be posted. Uh, essentially at all of our parks um, and the band will be in effect until the DNR lifts it. 
Um, the Mississippi High Banks uh, dispersed campsite has been under a campfire ban for quite some time, but all the other uh, areas where we have campfire designations will be closed and signed accordingly. Uh, so just want to let you know about that. Uh, lastly, I'll just follow up with some important dates. Uh, just a reminder, uh, since we meet on September the 7th, uh, that our offices, the county will be officially closed on September 6th in observance of Labor Day. Um, also, another important date is the Veterans Home okay. will have its groundbreaking on August the 26th that's at 10 a.m. And then finally, just wanted to remind you that the AMC Fall Policy Conference has been set for September the 16th and 17th and registration is open if you're interested. Uh, and of course, um, it's offsite or uh, you know out of town, so hotel reservations are also in order there as well. Um, lastly, policy committees for the AMC will meet on Thursday, September 16th from 1 to 4, and also on Friday the 17th from 8.30 to 11.30 if you happen to sit on any of those policy committees. So with that, I'll stand for questions you might have. Oh, I was going to ask you, um, it was a couple, couple announcements ago. Uh, do you know what is the timeline for the county? When do we think we will have redistricting done for, for the, the five uh, commissioner districts? So as I recall, I don't have the data in front of me, but we'll have, I think, until early next year before all of that has to be finalized. So And we don't, we, it doesn't, we work independently of the state. Right. So we don't have to wait for them or they don't wait for us. We, we all and we do our own thing. They do their thing. I think we have to wait for the city first, so don't we? Yeah, there's some coordination okay. that has to occur because we have to align some of our boundaries with some of the other jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, and we have to make sure that population numbers work within those boundaries. So okay. there's some pretty specific rules about how to do this. This will be an exercise in mapping and GIS analysis. So we know that ward three the city ward three is out of whack i, I assume because of the annexation that it's oh. probably heavy on citizens so those that that ward will probably be split up amongst the uh uh contiguous wards or whatever so the the city the city's map will change somewhat right and we're going to have to pay particular attention to precinct boundaries as well so um so all of that was are the things that I'm going to try to get staff up to speed on. Most of our staff haven't been around in a census and redistricting uh, situation before, so it'll be fairly new. Um, but you know, there's pretty good guidance and a lot of uh, specific rules um, that have to be followed. And so getting ahead of this sooner than later is, is going to be important. Sure. Yes. Who ultimately makes that decision? Who? What? Why did gerrymandering come about? I mean, why? <laughs> how and why and who actually makes those decisions? Who decides whether we make that boundary down 14th Street and mm -hmm. then up 6th Avenue and over back on 27th? Who, who, who decides the, that? The city council does. I mean, for the city and we do for the county, we have the ultimate authority. And that's, I think that's what lends to gerrymandering is that the, the, the electeds get, have the, the authority to create their districts, you know, I think for for us, sounds like the fox watching them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think for I mean, when I started, Mr. Chair, my district was the biggest and by geography I, or by by population. By population. Okay, and, and it has to be within ten percent. Mm -hmm. And I believe now I, my district is the smallest. Okay, within a ten percent mm -hmm. uh, variance. So I, I, I was I mean, just always curious. I I don't ever remember. Would only been one time when mm -hmm. we had a census, right? That I was so it was twenty. Would have been in 11, 12, 2010, yeah. 11, yep. yeah. When I was involved, I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember that discussion mm -hmm. at this table. Mm -hmm. So it's probably snuck <clears throat> into the consent agenda. <laughs> which which commissioner, Commissioner Lukacek, which commissioner had to rerun that year? Do you remember? Was that you, you or was that somebody else? Oh, you didn't have to rerun. Oh, I thought you did. I thought you did too, but you didn't. I thought that you had had to rerun I've like had, I've had four years on each time. Okay. Because my my understanding is that if if a district gains five percent new constituents or more, that then that seat has to come up for re-election. So and that would that wouldn't affect 
the two of you because right. you're up anyway. We're up anyways. Yep. But for the three of us, if our if our um, if our boundary if our if we gain new new constituents, so like I have the three city wards in Eccles. If if for whatever reason the that population went down and I had to pick up Grant Township or Lammers Township, then I would have all these new people, and then then uh, war, uh, District Two would come up for reelection. Or for, for election. The, the way that a K explained it to me was that it was a drawing of straws the last time amongst the three commissioners as to who had to um, who had to get uh, re, who had to go for re-election. Huh. That, that that's what I recall K telling me from the last one. I, I just yeah I, sorry I don't I don't have a recall of what uh -huh. happened in the 2010 2011 mm -hmm. chain because it, it would have been the 2012 election year right right um yeah so what will likely happen is we'll have to develop some sort of redistricting committee it might be a committee of the whole it might be however you want to approach that but i think the first thing to do is to get the staff kind of up to speed with what needs to happen the time frames by which it needs to happen and what the rules are and how that might impact things and um and then maybe do an exercise very cursory exercise in, in gis analytics the mapping analytics to see how big of a deal is this? Uh, fortunately, there hasn't been a huge change in our population, um, but there has been potentially enough change to cause some 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 adjustments that need to be made. So anyway, there's a lot of time we have on this. I just bring it up to you because I know that there's more conversation that's occurring. I just want to let you know it is also on our radar. And so it's something that we're tracking and, and going to be aware. But final comment. What you, I just wanted to be clear on your statement, Tom. Um, there's two sides of that. Has Beltrami County had an influx of population? Mm -hmm. No. But like Reed said, there's been a a change within right. moving from a redistribution redistribution kind of, of yeah. that same population mm -hmm. within our county. Um, I anticipate looking in the crystal ball, I anticipate some growth in the next five to ten years in Beltrami County mm -hmm. of moving away from larger urban centers, watching the the uh, real estate market there there is a definite pattern of, yeah. of house sales real uh, real estate sales that are showing that uh, quote unquote outstate minnesota is changing and it's growing and the urban centers are moving out yeah, yeah. And Mr. Chair, we have, we have been growing by you know 300 just in the rural areas, as Commissioner Lukacic just alluded to, um, from the Beltrami Electric standpoint. I know we've been doing approximately 300 new services per year, so you know that there has been growth. So that's a you know over 10 year span, at least 3,000 new services there. So and other and counties still have lost population. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, well, that's I mean that's the. Th I think that that rural rural Minnesota has lost population yeah. over the last decade, but I think that there are some more immediate trends that maybe aren't captured in the in the census data because they're so new. Um, but I I, am at, I think that the city of Bemidji has grown, and so it'll be interesting to see how the new wards come out um, and how that affects. I mean, the, from a selfish perspective, how that affects my district or whatever because because it is the the more urban of the of the districts um, for commissioner Lukacek, you know his um ward three the growth that they would have is that would be into northern township and he has both of those in his district so his change unless something changes dramatically from the city standpoint wouldn't really affect other than just the growth in that area right yeah but I think that there's there's both the growth by annexation, but then there is just also natural population growth right. in the city. I, I believe because yeah. um, I think now the city is over five thousand, fifteen thousand, and I think the last census it was fourteen five. Um, so it, I think it's grown by a bit. The last one was so much fun. I'd love to run another primary campaign. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Why not? Let's, Be careful what you wish hey, for. Can, I, I think that we can change these to two year terms if we wanted to. So it's just, uh, it's, uh, then you could be campaigning constantly. Constantly, right, right. Be a little more like the house. Yeah. All right. Any other, uh, anything else to add? No, sir. Uh, thank you. Should we take a little, or oh, Tim, did you? Mr. Chair, uh, I know in the past, uh, uh, Kay used to sign us up for the AMC file conference or, or all these AMC events. I don't know if that's going to, uh, if, uh, Mr. Barry is going to continue that, or, or do we, or do we sign up on our own? I guess. I, 
that's a great question. So I can do either, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. Smoother. For me, it was easier yeah. when Kay did it. Okay. So uh, I just need to know who wants to attend and, and what dates you're going to be there and I'll get you registered and then um, we can get you hotel accommodations as well. Would, would you like us to email you? That'd be great. And then we can tell you what we're, if we're planning to go at all or if we're going to be there the whole time or somewhere in between. That would be perfect. Yeah. And uh, if you're curious about the dates and all that stuff and what the agenda is, the AMC website has all of that stuff on it. So if you just, if you can't make one date, just let me know. I won't get a hotel so we don't waste the money, but. Uh, just let us know and then uh, and then we can deal with carpooling and other sorts of things, however you want to get to and from there. But uh, but if you could at least give me the dates that you want to attend and uh, and let me know that you're interested, then we'll we'll get you registered and set up for that. Sooner the better to to get it to you so yeah. that you can we get you discounted get rates the sooner you do it. So yeah. Yeah, that's and they do fill up. They do. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to have to stay at a hotel in Alexandria and have to commute. Perfect. Yeah. Um, all right. Well then yeah, just let let Tom know. Um, and uh, anything else for the good of the work meeting? Then let's recess and or take a let's end the meeting, and we'll come back in uh, fifteen minutes for the for the real show. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> for a minute. <laughs> I, think I think we're ready. Yeah, yeah okay. No. All right, well, we will call this meeting to order and we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I, I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, individual, with liberty and justice for all. Nancy Ferguson would have been proud of that one. <laughs> <laughs> so enough, Perfect. Oh. <laughs> Proper diction. All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh... That will suffice as my uh, general comments. Uh, so now we'll move on to uh, citizens addressing the board. Uh, anyone wishing to address the county board on an item not on the agenda may come forward at this time. To be recognized by the board chair, please state your name and address for the record. Comments are limited to five minutes. A person, a personnel complaint against an individual county employee may not be heard initially at a board meeting. Personnel complaints may be submitted to the board in writing through the county administrator's office. A person addressing the board may not use profanity nor vulgar language. So if there's anybody that would like to step forward, please do so now and state your name and address for the record. Hi, Bruce Schumann. I live at 17 538 Grassy Island Lane in Heights, Minnesota, right next to that giant VRBO that they put on the screen last month. I don't know if you guys, no. Tim, you didn't see it. You weren't here at that meeting. But it's like 22 people is what it says which is a guess. They have one guy show up, he gets the keys, then the rest pile in. Last week, there was 32 people, which I've been talking with Brent Ruth and I've been sending him a lot of information. He told me he was giving it to you people. I don't know if that's happened or not, but I've been doing a lot of research looking at VRBOs. I found nothing positive from a neighbor's that you know from the rest of the citizens the only positive thing is the guy that owns it and he's making money from it. that's it there was a comment about well it's nice if somebody wants to let it go for two weeks they're gone that's fine but these people are buying it they don't live there it's bought under an llc they spend two weeks a year there so they have to rent it out the rest of the time which it's been going on for two years now, what I found this morning, actually, was that Beltrami County has put a ban or had a ban on short-term rentals since 2018. It was on Lakeland News last month. They had a segment, and that's actually on there as well. It said that the board right now, I guess the council is looking at I guess bringing back the VRBOs, short-term rentals, in getting rid of the ban. Now, is that true? Is there a ban? Has there been a ban on? Does anyone oh, know? So just a point of clarification. I think you're referring to the to the Joint Planning Board, which is the City of Bemidji Northern Township. They had a no, moratorium. No, 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 no. no. This is Beltrami County. This no, what, that's not accurate. That's yeah. not accurate. No. no, the 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 planning board or the yeah the planning authority for the city of Bemidji and, and Northern Township did have a moratorium that they're that they're looking at revising. Um, we we have not. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, because there's two. There's a the Lakeland one in the drill article written by woman last name Milo. I've sent it to Brent Rude, so he has that as well. But what I'm asking today is like I said, I see no good in this for there's nothing positive for a neighborhood bringing a VRBO short term rental into that area. Where we live, there's 10 houses that's in that proximity and they're all retired. Eight out of the 10 are retired people. On a lake lot, they're about 150 feet wide. You put 32 people into a concentration like that, it's going to be noisy. Every, all their activities are outside. They got volleyball, basketball, trampolines, campfire, big rings, that type of thing. With 32 people, there's a noise level that's just not normal for a neighborhood. I mean, I could see it. It's like the Olympics, you know, last week. 
So anyway, what I'm asking today is for you guys to put a ban on it. I know you're looking at it. That's great. You, you need to look at it. But in the interim, we've lived with it for two years. I mean, put a ban on it now. Let these guys suffer a little bit. We've been suffering for a while. Now, I know there's a nuisance clause that's in the, what do they call it, the Shoreland Ordinance. We're beyond nuisance. We've exceeded misery, and now we're into almost outrageous. So what I'm asking is just to consider banning these things until you come up with something that's going to be viable. I'll be more than willing to work on the committee that works on it. So you guys have any questions? Believe me, I've been looking at this for all, a long time. Generally, it's a, it's a public comment portion. It's not really a back and forth. It's just your opportunity to, to say whatever you want. But I would, I would encourage you to get a hold of, well, you've been talking with Brent. Um, the, the planning commission will be looking at this. I believe at their next meeting is, is, is our understanding. Um, Commissioner Gosfig is on the on the he's the county board liaison to the planning commission, so um, you can get a hold of him if you want to talk to him. And I've been or assured that, that it is happening uh, at our meeting on Monday that we will be discussing it. You want to show up Monday? I, you could. Um, that's you know we're going to be discussing it probably in our work session, which isn't a, a public input session. We're going to be bringing it forth to the board for the first time and uh, getting. Uh, you know, information to us from Brent and and then discussing it, I, I would hope. All right, like I said, I'm available. Yeah, they, I'll donate my yeah. time. That's fine. Yeah, so. they, the public is is welcome to attend. Just a matter of the, if it's in the work session, that's not a public deal, just like our work sessions aren't typically a public thing. You can attend, you can listen, yep. and yep. knowledge. That's all we can do. Yep. yep. Yeah, and, and there, you, there will be, and we'll be talking about this probably through the fall and into the winter is my guess. And so there'll be opportunity. Exactly. So what I'm asking is if you guys could just put a ban on it until you come up with something. <laughs> I know you're yeah. saying, no, you know, it's like these people have rights, but so do we. Mm -hmm. And it's just not normal having that many people in one building like yeah. that. It's just not. Anyway, thanks for your time. And thank you for coming. Thank you for expressing your concerns. <laughs> is <laughs> thank you for the invitation yeah. i'll check my schedule uh, <laughs> uh, is there anybody else that would like to approach the board uh with an item that is not on the agenda seeing no one approach we will move on with our with the meeting and uh, move to approval of the agenda. Mr. Chair, I, I uh, move to approve the agenda with no additions, corrections, or deletions. Thank Second. you. Thank you, Commissioner Sumner. Thank you, Commissioner Anderson. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. Uh, all those in favor of approval of the board please, of the agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That motion carries. Now I'll look for a motion to approve the consent agenda as, we'll as the presented. consent agenda, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Lukacek. Is I'll second a, it. Thank you, Commissioner Gosvik. Any other discussion? Anyone want to pull anything in from the consent agenda? It's a short and sweet one this week. Hearing none, I'll call the question then. Uh, all those in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. The consent agenda is approved. We will now move on to our regular agenda, uh, which has one item, which is the uh, appointment of an HRA board member. And um, I am the uh, board's liaison to the Beltrami um, uh, uh, Housing and Redevelopment Authority. Um, we had a vacancy. The the as as we have asked in the past on on event on filling board positions like this. It was very heavily advertised, and we, we, they went so far as to posting uh, the notice on. You know, they they look at they look they oversee the conifer estates, and they really wanted to try to get um, a lot of times the makeup of the of the HRA. It's kind of um, realtors and bankers tend to to be on there because of their expertise, and they really wanted to try to get someone with 
with some lived experience in public housing and uh, and they were successful in doing that. And so the person that they that they are recommending that we approve um, does have that lived experience. Um, and I think we'll bring a really good perspective that is perhaps lacking on the on the board. So I would also agree with the uh, with the um, with the with the HRA board in in recommending this person for approval. And so I don't know if there's any other questions. Um, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, it's in, um, in it's, our uh, deal. It's Jamie Nye's one. Thank you. Um, I don't know the person personally, but they uh, they they had they interviewed really well, and they have a lot of uh, they do a lot in the community already, um, and so I think they'll be a good person. Uh, Mr. Chair, so these uh, appointments are are they a two year, three year, four year appointment? Uh, I. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was gonna say, I don't think that they I don't think that they have a, a, a set term. I think that they're they're Yeah, because you now Jim, you Commissioner Lukacek, you were on you were in my position previously. And I think that at that time, some of the people that were on the board had been there for 20 years. The chair right? was on for 33 for, years. OK, yeah. And, and I know that there is that I took exception. To yeah. I just well, thought that, you know, it should it shouldn't be that way. It yeah. should be. Uh, a, as Commissioner Sumner, I think, is asking is, you know, is there some means of rolling that over mm -hmm. and trying to get some diversity on the board? And I, I really encourage that. Yeah. And, and I think that now there, there the, since I've been on there, there's been quite a bit of turnover. Um, and uh, and so we do we are getting new people on. And I think this was a good step that they made to, to try to be a more inclusive and have a have a, a more, I guess, diversity on the board diversity of of perspectives and experiences on the board I, I don't know who i don't know under what authority the hra exists is that under state statute or is it because sometimes state statute decides whether or not there's a um whether or not it's if you you can you know it's common to serve to have like a two-year term and you can serve three terms and then you have to get off the board for a year or two years and then you can come back on I don't know if I don't know what the statutes are that, that guide that, but maybe that's something that we could look at. Um, something I can ask them. Um, that would and, be good. I think if you found that out, yeah, that'd be good. But I, I don't think that that is germane to this. Well, tangentially, I suppose. But right. um, I'll, I don't know. I'll move that we accept that Second. appointment of Jamie. Last name. Nice wander. Nice wander. Second. Thank you, Commissioners Lukacek and uh, and Anderson. Is there any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the appointment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. That carries. Um, and then that brings us to uh, the legislative and lobbying issues. Richard Gaspic, you doing any lobbying lately? Um, sort of, uh, based on the, as I saw you at the redistricting meeting a little over a week ago, I uh, did testify um, just to you know, try to put some common sense things to, to the redistricting. And um, so that was my only legislative lobbying type stuff. I, I was able to stay there throughout the technical difficulties. And then as soon as they got back running again, which took about 45 yeah. minutes or so, then I, I had to move on to other other things. So I wasn't able to, I did hear your testimony and thank you for, for being there, um, but I wasn't able to hear much uh, other than that. Um, um, and so, yeah, that was the extent of my lobbying. Uh, Commissioner uh, Sumner? Uh, no. Uh, legislative or lobbying. Okay, Commissioner Anderson. No legislative. Commissioner Lukacek, no. Thank you. Do you wanna roll into a commissioner report? I'm good, thank you. All right, Commissioner Anderson. Yeah, I'm good, except uh, just wanna mention that, uh, was that the fair? Uh, three or four different times, uh, it was well attended mm -hmm. and uh, hot <laughs> in the afternoon. Uh, and the presenting of the uh, plaque and the flag to the uh, farm family went well. Oh, great. Jack and uh, uh, Jeff uh, Molnar. And, uh, so it was a good attendance. Super. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Summer. Uh, yeah, I, I attended uh, the fair um, over the weekend. Um, it seemed to be well attended. Um, and as for committee assignments and, and whatnot, uh, I will be attending the AMC uh, retreat um, shortly after this meeting, heading out to 
to uh, AMC President uh, Spey. He's hosting uh, the AMC board oh, wow. for the next couple of days um, up in Lake County. In Lake County. So uh, that's where I will be at. And Is it a six hour drive from here? I hope not because <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're getting there late. <laughs> but that that's uh, my my report. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Casper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and to reiterate that the fair was uh, very successful. Attendance was up significantly. Uh, sales for vendors were up. Um, haven't got actual details yet. We normally would have had our meeting last night, but because of the, it being right after the fair, they postponed our meeting to next Monday night. And so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing those numbers and maybe having a report next time on that. Um, but just in general, it was very well attended. And, and so that was good. Um, we had a solid waste committee meeting this morning and uh, directed um, uh, Brian Olson to um, look into getting some new bids on some concrete work that needs to be done at the at the transfer station there where there's some erosion happening and and also on uh, the HVAC system and and uh, Administrator Barry is going to look at um, seeing if we can utilize um, take a relook at some of the ARP money for some of that type of stuff. So, super. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, and for my report again, I, I also attended the fair uh, two different days and. It was packed. Yeah, I was on Sunday, and I thought that Sunday would be a little. It was a little bit lighter, but it was still pretty busy for the four hours that they were open. And I think the county had a really great booth. I, I hung out there a little bit both of the times that I was there, and had a lot of fun. Um, the one one item I'll, I'll mention is tonight. Yet I'll be meeting with the KRLS uh, uh, personnel committee, um, which I recently got appointed to, and it was going to be a busy, busy committee. We um, just to keep you a little bit up to date, our our director, uh, our executive director put in her resignation notice and she'll be leaving the, the system uh, in the middle of September. Um, well, a little over a year ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a it is a difficult, difficult position to hire for. Um, and I, I think a lot of it is is geography. I think it's hard to entice people to move to Pine River. Um, there's just not a lot there. Um, and uh, and so um, we'll we are tonight we're going to be discussing uh, a, a temporary um, uh, the appointment of an interim director, someone who has retired that has that has experience uh, managing a system. I don't recall where the individual is from or or what their experience is, or even their name right now. Um, but we'll be discussing that tonight. And um, and we're having a, normally we don't meet in August, but we'll be meeting Thursday uh, down in Pine River to discuss what we're gonna move, how we're gonna move forward. And so tonight's meeting is gonna be the first step of that, of figuring out what we're gonna do. But it's gonna be, uh, uh, it's, it's gonna be tough to, to, to find a replacement. I, I forget how long it took to, to find Miriam, what, 20 some years ago uh, that, that, that who has been with us, our director for so long and replacing her is proving to really be a challenge. So, um, but we will might be, this will probably play into the discussion that the uh, library, the KRLS task force that will be meeting in the next month or so, um, uh, we'll probably be talking about that there as well. So um, we'll keep you posted as we, uh, as we know more. Um, and Chair, yes. So if, if Geography is an issue. Couldn't they move it somewhere? Well, that's that is a uh, suggestion that I made quietly, um, and I don't want my geography to. I mean, I'm biased, but I, I think I, I had suggested kind of quietly that maybe we look at relocating the the headquarters to Bemidji because it's the largest community in the system. The the thing about that they said about Pine River is that it's fairly centrally located. Unless you live in Black Duck, then it's not centrally located at all. But um, but in Bemidji, we we may be able to attract talent. Um, I mean, even you know, even hiring our branch manager in Bemidji, though. When um, oh shoot, now I can't think. Was it Ken? I can't remember the gentleman that was the previous manager. He was there for years. Wonderful man. Um, but he was difficult to replace. It took us a while before we found Sherry, who is the current manager um, of the Bemidji Library. So if so maybe moving to Bemidji isn't the answer, but I, I don't know if keeping the headquarters in, in Pine River is, I don't know. Um, 
it's just a tough, and then there's, there's, I mean, how many people have advanced library degrees that also have experience managing uh, large organizations? Um, but we'll- I remember when they were, when the uh, human cannonball resigned from the circus, it was hard to replace them because they couldn't find somebody that's just callum. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Thank you for, oh. for that. <laughs> Place that. Painful, yeah. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I've never suggested bringing up a formal censure until. <laughs> uh, hold the quote. <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll call that the second to, to, to Craig's uh, uh, motion. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> wow. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everybody, for coming in tonight.